Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is about 10 times the crowd we had last time. It must be because of our speaker. If, if Scott, Scott Mingus is out there, he's probably just shaking his head. But he's, he's on a plane. He's on a plane. Uh, so thank you for coming tonight uh, to uh, to listen to Dami uh, Miller talk about the 87th. I'm sure, well, she's going to go into a lot more detail, uh, but everybody knows uh, the significance of that unit locally. Uh, my name is Adam Bentz. I'm the Assistant Director of the Library and Archives at the History Center, and we're very happy to have a partnership with uh, Kathy Friel and uh, Scott Mingus, who's not here, and Scott Rosenau, who are the directors of the Roundtable. How long have we had? How long have we had? Yeah, since we've been here? October 2007. So since October 2007, which is nearly 15 years ago. Okay, that's amazing. Um, if I could just go through a few upcoming events, um, our kind of obligation uh, to uh, share upcoming History Center events, and then I'll turn things over to Scott. Uh, we're going to do the raffle, which some of you probably have participated in. Um, and then we'll get started with Dami's presentation tonight. So a week from tonight, always a week after the uh, Civil War Roundtable, the All Vets organization, uh, led by Linda Bean, sitting in the back, um, will be back here. Uh, it's a week from tonight at 7 o'clock, and they'll be welcoming veteran Jim Myers, who served in Vietnam in the Marine Corps uh, from 1969 to 1970 in the Anhoa uh, Bush in the infantry. So he'll be talking about his experience next Wednesday night. Um, big event coming up next, wait, two weekends from now. Um, uh, we are bringing back the Book Blast, which probably many of you are familiar with. Uh, it was a library and archives staple for many years. Um, this time, the friends of the York County History Center have taken over Book Blast, and they've done a great job at getting a gigantic amount of books donated. Uh, that will be starting, officially running from September 30th through October, October 1st. Please check our website for the details because the times change from day to day. So if you're interested in doing the book blast, check our website. That will be taking place at the Agricultural and Industrial Museum on Princess Street as it has in the past. If you are a History Center member, please join us on uh, our early sale, which will be on September 27th. So that's, those dates don't make sense to me. 30th through the 1st. It's the 29th through the 1st. Well, let's see. Let me let me restate. So we're, the event will be taking place two Fridays from now. Um, so that Friday and Saturday. But next Thursday, that's two Thursdays from now, uh, will be uh, a History Center member's early sale. I swear I took these numbers right off of right off of the website. So anyway, uh, but anyway, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday that will be taking place. Like I said, please check the website for details on the time. And if you've ever done it before, you'll know that the final day, which is October first, um, is our buck a bag day. So it's our way of saying, please take all these books away before we have to find another place for you. Uh, so please show up on the first and help us out uh, and, and make a little bit extra money for the History Center. Um, on October 2nd, that's uh, Sunday, October 2nd at 2.30, from 2.30 to 4, we'll be welcoming back the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society. And they will be featuring speaker Professor Charles Kaufman, who is an adjunct at York College, and he will be presenting on Indian languages influence in the Susquehanna region, so Na Native American language influence on our area. Uh, the following Saturday after that, October 10th, will be our second Saturday, Saturday event, and uh, we'll be welcoming Lynn Matluck Brooks, who will be discussing the history of dance. Always something different going on here. Uh, then the following weekend, this is the last event I'm going to talk about tonight, um, is Oyster Fest, which you've probably heard about before as well. I think it is the 48th year that the History Center and its predecessor organizations have been hosting Oyster Fest. That'll be at the Agricultural and Industrial Museum. Again, that's on Sunday, October 16th 
from 10 until 4. And unlike last two years, this will be an in-person event. So uh, we'll be trying to get back to normal as much as we can. And if you like oysters, great. And if you don't like oysters, come anyway, because there will be other kinds of food there. Uh, this is their official slogan, I think, is it's not just oysters. <laughs> um, you know, which is okay for me because I love oysters. So if you don't like them, all the better. All right. Um, that's about all I have. So I'll ask Scott Rosen now to come up and uh, we can um, conduct the raffle for the two items that we've had on the website for several months now. We were able to raise a little bit of money to fund our speaker fees. Thank you, Adam. Uh, again, wel welcome everyone. Uh, glad to see such a large attendance here this evening for the uh, tonight's speaker. Uh, before we introduce tonight's speaker, I'm just going to tell you about next month's program. We're going to welcome back Cody Aish, who spoke to us last year, and this time he's going to be talking about the Lutheran Seminary at the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, which um, is where the battle opened on July 1st, 1863. It came to the seminary's door, leaving it in its wake hundreds of wounded soldiers, thousands of dollars of property damage, and countless stories of heroism. And this presentation will cover the use of the building, cupola, campus by Union soldiers, the Signal Corps, and the First Corps Infantry and Artillery. Origins of one of Gettysburg's largest military hospitals and the occupation of the grounds by the Confederate High Command. And the impact of Civil War's bloodiest battle on students, faculty, and civilians who live there. Cody is a graduate of Shippensburg, serves as a director and ed of education museum operations at the Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, and conducts tours and he lectures for National Park Service sites, historical societies and round tables, and educational groups and other organizations. He's published articles, essays, and local papers, magazines, national journals, and he's a founding contributor to the collaborative project Pennsylvania in the Civil War. He writes book reviews for Civil War Monitor and maintains a Facebook blog, Cody A. Schreider and Historian, which focuses on the Civil War era, which I've seen some interesting things on there as well. Uh, tonight, we're going to have Dami Miller speak to us about the 87th Pennsylvania, which, as Adam mentioned, has a lot of local ties. So glad to see a lot of people here to learn more about this local regiment. Uh, Dami is joining us. She's the Third Court Circuit Court of Appeals librarian for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. She's founded the, the Preserving the History of Newburytown, and she's the author of two cookbooks. And she's also partnering right now with Dr. Jamie Norpel with, for a series of educational videos, which you can see on Facebook, called Hometown History. And as a reenactor, which you can see her here tonight, she portrays a private and company C of the 87th Pennsylvania Regiment. And hope to hear more about that in her presentation. So now we're going to get to the raffle. Uh, we're thankful for all the people who did donate through either buying tickets or uh, just giving cash donations. Through this raffle and fundraiser, we have raised $325 from, from various donors and, and people participating in the raffle. So uh, now first, the first item we're gonna raffle is the bond, the Confederate bond that has the image of Stonewall Jackson. And Dami's gonna draw the name there. Yeah, I'm John Shu. John Shu. John Shu. Is, is he here? <laughs> John Shu is my name. I was sitting there and I thought, I think I might win something. You're <laughs> <laughs> lucky night. Thank you. If you like, I can keep it on the table over here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, mix these right. up a little bit. Yeah. And now Dami's going to draw the winner for the Dale Gallon print. That is Beth Klingensmith. Beth Klingensmith. Is she here this evening? Okay. Uh, since Beth isn't uh, here this evening, if she could just contact the History Center to claim her prize. Yes. So we do want to thank everyone again who did participate in the raffle and who did donate to the fundraiser. It'll help. Uh, 
pay for our presenters, our speakers, such as Dami, who, who come and give us wonderful presentations. And we definitely look forward to what she has to tell us this evening. Hi, everybody, and thank you for coming tonight. Um, it's such an honor to be here because I have ancestors that are in the 87th Pennsylvania. So to be in 2022 and being a female, <laughs> um, pretending to be a man in the army and reenacting with the 87th, it's just an honor for me to be able to share the 87th with all of you. So tonight I'm going to go through a little bit of the history of the 87th, um, bring it to modern day, and then I'm going to talk about some notable uh, York Countyans that were in the 87th Pennsylvania. So the 87th was called the Boys from York. The 87th was organized at York, Pennsylvania and mustered in for a three-year enlistment in September 1861 under the command of Colonel George Hay, and I'm sure that that is a name that many of you are familiar with. Lewis Miller, another famous York Countyan that we're going to talk about tonight, he did a lot of artwork, especially during the Civil War. Miller was evidently in York in 1861 when he was a military camp on the fairgrounds, at the time near the intersection of King and Queen Streets. The site had been converted to a training facility for Colonel George Hay's 87th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, or Infantry Regiment. Soon after the commencement of the Civil War, one of two related pieces, which I'm showing you, depicts half of the regiment marching off uh, for the depot on September 16th, and another, dated September 28th, shows the remaining companies at York's Northern Central Railroad Station, embarking to join their comrades guarding the railroad's northern tracks of Baltimore. Local people of all ages are pictured giving them a hearty send-off. So what I like about Lewis Miller so much besides being in York County, is he's showing what life was really like for York Countyans during the Civil War. And this is a great depiction. Not many regiments can say that they have artwork depicting the training in their town. Detailed service for the 87th. So this is our record banner, which you can actually see at the uh, PA Capital Preservation Committee headquarters in Harrisburg. Um, I believe at one point it was uh, on display in the Capitol building, but right now it's in the Preservation Center. And the record banner um, was composed of men from York, Adams, Cumberland, Dolphin, Allegheny, Lawrence, and Franklin counties. The 87th was organized in September 1861. The state color was presented to seven companies of the regiment in Monument Square of Baltimore on February 22nd, 1862. In late 1864, those who did not re-enlist took the small remnant of the state color home and gave it to George Hay, the regiment's first colonel. Because most of the flag was shot to pieces, their survivors made this small banner with the names of the major engagements the 87th fought. The rest of the regiment was mustered out of service on June 29th, 1865. And we did get to see it, and this was a picture um, that I took from the website, but I have some pictures that I took, um, and it was great to see it in person. So 1861 is the start of um, the 87th history. And this is some of the newspaper headlines that were going around in York during the start of the war. Traitors beware, Pennsylvania unit, um, party lines, uh, obliterated war excitement. So York County was really excited about the war and anticipating what was to come. So on September 14th, 1861, the 87th was organized in New York, Pennsylvania, like I said. Um, they were mustered in for a three-year enlistment in September 1861 under the command of Colonel George Hay. Uh, here's a picture from Jim McClure, who's with us tonight. Um, he had this in the York Daily Record. This is the York Fairgrounds, then southeast of King and Queen Streets in York, and that became the venue for green recruits to be molded into soldiers. Um, getting the troops ready, this was a countywide affair. Uh, the Hans Brothers Hardware Store supplied the gunpowder. P, A, and S Smalls Hardware donated lead for the bullets. Um, there was local blacksmiths like Jacob Detter and tinsmith George Waints, and they cast 40 rounds of bullets per man. And they stopped doing work, um, you know, that would better their careers and put money in their pocket to help the war effort. And if you ever read Home Guards to Heroes, and that is the book about the 87th um, written by uh, historian uh, Dennis Grant, um, he talks about the different companies, and he had little uh, descriptions for them. So uh, companies A and K were mainly from York Borough. Uh, company B 
uh, my favorite because these men, there were 45 men from Newbury Township was where I'm from. He could describe them as a mongrel outfit. And I'm not really sure why he called them mongrels, but I'm proud to be a mongrel. Uh, company C and D were farm boys and laborers from Southern York County. Company E, unfortunately, was known for having the highest casualty rate. Company F was from Gettysburg. So you're gonna think about Jenny Wade and John Skelly, and they're gonna come up later, but they are from 87th fame. Company G was a company with problems. That's how he described them, a company with problems. Company H was the men from Wellsville and company I were the men from New Oxford. So as you can see, there was um, a good mix of men from York County and the surrounding areas in the 87th. So our detailed service started in 1861 guarding the railroad. Getting the Northern Central Railway running was vital to the Union's existence. In the opinion of the United States Army's commanding general, it was the most vital rail line of them all. On the 28th of September, the regiment traveled by rail through Hanover Junction and Glenrock down to Coffeysville, Maryland, where the men guarded the bridges of the Northern Central Railway until May of 1862 when they went to Baltimore. We were all getting along fine here, plenty to eat and nothing to do. Doing guard duty and fishing, catching a great many things that did not look like fish. Some had frocks and some had feathers. And that's an excerpt from the diary of George Washington Shriver. Uh, time, you know, was just being wasted, waiting, guarding the railroad, waiting for active duty. And when you have a bunch of men in the army just waiting around doing nothing, that's going to lead to leadership issues, which is going to lead to discipline issues, which is going to lead to low morale, harsh punishments. People weren't getting along. They were getting antsy and they really wanted to see battle. And that's going to bring us to 1862, more waiting. So 1862, we were stuck with the middle department. So we were attached to the railroad guard of the middle department in May of 1862. Then we went to Baltimore, Maryland. And that was in June of 1862. And then we were at New Creek, West Virginia until August 20th. Then we had an expedition under General Kelly across Laurel Hill and the Rich Mountains from August 27th to September 12th. And then we went over cheap in the Allegheny Mountains, October 31st to November 12th. And then we were present for the march on Petersburg, West Virginia on December 6th to the 9th. And it's interesting during this time, um, there was a newspaper called the Wrightsville Star and they had to stop production because five of their staff members joined the 87th, joined the army and went to war. So they had, you know, I, I assume they had more than five staff members total, but with a bulk of their staff members gone, they had to stop writing the newspaper for a while. Um, but it did say in the notes that they did um, resume production of the newspaper after the war, but during the war they shut down because all of their men were away. And that brings us to 1863 and the Second Battle of Winchester. The 87th engaged in a sharp firefight with Confederate Maryland Cavalry under Major General uh, Harry, Major Harry Gilmore under today's Route 11 south of Winchester, Virginia. This skirmish marked the opening shots of what became known as the Second Battle of Winchester, culminating in the early morning hours of June 15th with the surrender of almost half of the regiment at Carter's Woods after Major General Robert H. Milroy desperately tried to get most of his 8,000 man division of the 8th Army Corps out of the encirclement at Winchester. On Sunday, June 14th, Milroy had stayed put in Winchester against the orders of the War Department in Washington, D.C. All day Sunday, Milroy was up looking out 40 feet above the works with a field glass in hand watching Lee's veterans closing around our brave and devoted little army. The 87th Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel James A. Steele later penned. What an uncomfortable time we had, he lamented. No sleep, nor rest for two days. Rations are getting short, everybody wet to the skin, all ready for immediate action with the outlook, anything but reassuring. We knew we were being surrounded on all sides, Stahl continued. That rebel pickets were out on every road. It is any wonder that the men became despondent and lost heart. And that's an excerpt from uh, the 87th baptism under fire in the Civil War from the great Scott Mingus. So during this, um, about 4,000 men were taken prisoner and went missing. Um, the news of the Confederate victory so close to the Mason-Dixon line was a shock to the North. Secretary of War Edward Stanton called for militia units to be federalized, and President Abraham Lincoln called for 100,000 volunteers. 
Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin called for 50,000 volunteers. So this really sent shockwaves through Pennsylvania and it affected the 87 ultimately. That brings us to June 28, 1863 and the Confederate occupation of York County. And this brings us back to Lewis Miller, a famous York Countyan. Lewis Miller's artwork depicting scenes of the three-day Confederate occupation of the town before the Southern Army was called away to the gathering storm at Gettysburg. One view shows the invading army marching towards Center Square. The other depicts the outsized American flag being taken down from the tall flag pole in the square and being handed over to CSA officers. He wrote of literally hearing the Battle of Gettysburg a few days later. I heard the cannons war, not 29 miles from where I stood in Old York. General Gordon arrived with General Jubal Early, each leading divisions down the streets of York, making it the largest and northernmost town to be occupied by Confederate forces. The soldiers marched to the center of town and removed the large US flag hanging on the pole, yet they did not raise another in its place, apparently at Farquhar's request. By accepting York's surrender didn't mean the town would escape with no consequences. General Early promptly demanded supplies for his troops along with $100,000 in cash, where he would sack the place in spite of their surrender. During the three-day occupation, the quotas of bread, sugar, coffee, molasses, meat, shoes, hats, and socks were met, but only $28,600 in case was raised from the civilians. General Early took what was given but refrained from his threat of violence, keeping the soldiers under strict orders not to harm the town. So you can see that this was a really divisive, scary time for the people in New York County. And then June 20th, 1863, the burning of the Wrightsville Bridge. Um, the 87th as an entire regiment was not there, but there were a handful of men from the 87th that had marched back to the York County area and they helped uh, defend Wrightsville and the bridge. That brings us to November 27th, December 2nd, 1863, Mine Run. At this point, morale was up on November 20th because the 87th had just been paid. And we know this because a lot of men in their diaries and notes home wrote that before this, getting paid was sketchy and they weren't sure when they were gonna get paid. And if you're not paying your soldiers, morale is gonna be down. And if morale's down, they're not gonna to wanna to fight. So thank goodness on November 20th, they had been paid. By November 26th, we saw 525 members of the 87th cross the Rapidan River by Pontoon Bridge. After trudging through the wilderness, the 87th met up with the 138th Pennsylvania. But unfortunately, their situation left them completely exposed in a horseshoe. When the 138th PA fell back under the rebel surge, the 87th was left alone and they were scared. So they decided to just turn tail and run back into the woods. That night, the weather really took a toll on the 87th and all of the men that were there. The pickets had to change every half hour to avoid frostbite that night, and their water froze in canteens. So morale was low. There was a ton of people wounded. They were trying to avoid frostbite. They were thirsty. They were hungry. It was just, um, it was a horrible fight for the 87th. And Meade concluded that con Confederate line was too strong to attack and retire during the night of December 1st and 2nd, ending the winter campaign of 1863. So what a blow to the army that was. And that brings us to 1864 and the Battle of the Wilderness. So this was the first Battle of Grant's 1864 overland campaign. The Army of the Potomac left their winter camps in Culliper County and marched south toward the Rapidan River. The arrival of the Union Sixth Corps did little more than broaden the front and lengthen the list of casualties. So right there it tells you what the outlook was. Longstreet is wounded at this battle on May 6th and leads to both sides digging in. And the battle ended up being a tactical draw, estimated to be the fourth bloodiest battle of the Civil War. May 8th to the 21st, 1864, the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. A 15 hour march brought the 87th to the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse and the battle took place over 12 days and cost 18,000 Union and 12,000 Confederate casualties. Grant won a strategic victory in the end by moving Lee's flank and continuing his advance on Richmond. By May 8th, uh, General, uh, Major General John Sedgwick, commander of the Union Sixth Court will be shot dead. This is uh, the highest ranking Union officer killed during the war at that point. 
And then we have the Battle of Cold Harbor, June 1st to the 12th, 1864. The small crossroads of Cold Harbor, just 12 miles north of Richmond, became the focal point of the action in late May. Hearing reports that Lee is extending his line to the James River, Grant is determined to extend his left flank over Power Lee and to come between the Confederates and Richmond, all while keeping access to the James River open. Confused orders and bad roads slowed the movement of the two federal corps. The 2nd, 6th, 18th corps launched the main attack through the darkness and the fog. Angles in the Confederate works allow Lee's men to easily infiltrate the federal, inflate the federal ranks as they advance. An estimated 7,000 men are killed and wounded within the first 30 minutes of this assault. The days are filled with minor attacks, artillery duels, and sniping. And on June 7th, Lee and Grant agreed to a two-hour truce to allow the Federals a chance to retrieve their wounding. Wounded. Reflecting later on the battle, Grant writes, I always regretted that the last assault at Cold Harbor was never made. No advantage, whatever was gained to compensate for the heavy losses that were sustained. And then the shining jewel in the 87th crown, the Battle of Monocacy, and it's called the Battle That Saved Washington, July 9th, 1864. The Battle of Monocacy began around 8.30 a.m. when Confederate skirmishers commanded by General Stephen Rancher Confederates looked for another way to cross the river. Confederate General John uh, McClawson's cavalry men, the, the Worthington Ford, almost a mile down river, um, forded almost a mile down river of Wallace's forces south of the, of the, I'm sorry. Confederate General John McClawson's cavalry men forded the Washington Ford almost a mile down river of the wooden covered bridge and by 1030 a.m. had begun to cross, placing pressure on Wallace's forces south of, south of the river. While the Confederates gained control of the Thomas farm, they were soon pushed back by federal forces in a salvage counterattack. Field maps like the one made by, of the Battle of Monoxy by Jedediah Hotchkiss provided valuable aid to commanders planning battle strategies. While the Confederates had won the Battle of Monocacy, Lew Wallace was ultimately successful. His efforts had delayed Jubal Early's advance long enough for additional Union reinforcements to reach Washington, D.C. Early wasn't able to take Washington. And Monocacy is where the 87th has our monument. So you can go there today and see a monument to the 87th, and that's our only monument. August to October 1864, the Third Battle of Winchester and Fisher's Hill. The Union victory at the Third Winchester began a series of losses for early in the valley from which it would never recover. The battle was the longest and costliest fought in the Shenandoah Valley. The veterans of Stonewall Jackson fired amazingly low so that the grass earth in front of the regiment was cut and torn up by a perfect sheet of lead. And that's a quote from Union Surgeon Harris H. Beecher from the 114th New York Infantry. Major General Jubal Early's army took up a defensive position at Fisher's Hill. The Confederates folded under the Union forces, opened the valley to Sheridan's two-week scorched earth operations. So that really helped them open up the south. October 19, 1864, the Battle of Cedar Creek. Early executed a surprise attack early on October 19th and drove three Union corps from the field. As Early paused to recognize, Sheridan arrived after a dramatic ride from Winchester in Early to rally his troops and launch a crushing counterattack from which Early's forces would never recover. One of the Union victories in late 1864 that helped ensure President Abraham Lincoln's re-election that November. And that brings us to 1865 and April 2nd, Petersburg. The siege of Petersburg continues to be known as an early example of trench warfare. At this time, the six courts were responsible for busting through the Confederates. And the 87th at this time was organized with the 1st Brigade, 3rd Division, 6th Army Corps. Grant then constructed trenches around the eastern portion of Richmond to the outskirts of Petersburg. The city was a major supply hub to the Confederate Army led by Robert E. Lee, who finally abandoned the city in 1865 and retreated, which led afterwards to his ultimate surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. And then the 87th was actually present. Some of the members of the 87th were present at Appomattox Courthouse when Lee surrendered. In June 29, 1865, the 87th was mustered out. The regiment lost a total of 202 men during the service. 10 officers and 80 enlisted men were killed or mortally wounded. 112 enlisted men died from disease-related causes. And then that brings us to the 87th today. So the 87th 
is currently a reenacting regiment that I'm a part of. Um, the 87th Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Company C is a family-oriented nonprofit Civil War reenacting and living history organization, and it's dedicated to the better understanding and preservation of the history of the American Civil War. The 87th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Company C participates in major, major battle reenactments and living history events, which are conducted for public education. The company also lends its support to the preservation of battlefields, monuments, and historic sites of the Civil War. Almost all of our active members have ancestors that served with the 87th, and a lot of them have members that were specifically in Company C. Um, over the past years that I've been involved with the 87th, I joined in 2017. We've done memorial ceremonies for ancestors that have been a part of the group. So we'll go to cemeteries and lay wreaths. Um, we will participate in parades. This summer, we went to a summer camp and uh, taught the kids about the Civil War. We do firing demonstrations, living history camps. It's not just all battle reenactments. Um, so I think it, it helps educate the general public about the Civil War and York in general. And then that brings us to the boys from York. I want to talk about some of our notable members um, that were in the 87th PA. And I'm going to start with Colonel George Hay. He was born in York in 1809. He was the Colonel of the 87th Pennsylvania and commanded the 1st Brigade, 2nd Division, 8th Army Corps. Hay was one of five delegates who met with the Confederate Brigadier General John B. Gordon on June 27, 1863 to discuss the terms by which the Confederates would occupy the borough following day. Hence, York became the largest northern town to fall to the rebels during the Civil War. He died in 1879 and is buried in Prospect Hill Cemetery here in New York. We have Colonel John William Shaw. He worked in the dry goods business here in New York and he was a first Lieutenant of the York Rifles. He received authority from the Secretary of War, Simon Cameron to organize a regiment at York. He was appointed Colonel but declined to accept and he was made Lieutenant Colonel and served as such until May 9th, 1862 when he was promoted to Colonel of his regiment. And then we have Johnson Hastings, Jack Skelly Jr. of Gettysburg fame. So born in Gettysburg in 1841, he was corporal in the 87th Pennsylvania Infantry. And he's famous for being a close friend or possible fiance of Jenny Wade. He died as a result of wounds sustained at the Second Battle of Winchester in 1863, and he's buried at Evergreen Cemetery near Jenny Wade in Gettysburg. Jeremiah Spar. This is my third great grandfather, and I only know about him because of the great Scott Mingus talking about him in his um, uh, Civil War murder mystery presentations. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah was born on July 9th in 1840 in Warrington Township, and he enlisted on September 9th, 1861 in Company H. He was arrested for murder in July 24th, 1863 charged with killing a certain colored man whose name is unknown, but who came into the neighborhood on Wednesday the 1st in company with Swartz Calvary. And this is from the Hanover Citizen. The story goes that this gentleman stole Jeremiah's horse. So Jeremiah and his brothers went out and killed him and they were acquitted of the murder before dinner that night and sent home. So Scott talks about this in his murder mystery presentation. He talks about a few different mysteries. Uh, and murders that happened. And sometimes you don't know who the person was that was murdered, who the murderer was, but it's a fantastic presentation. And he said, hey, I think some of you here might be related to Spar. That's a pretty common uh, York last name. And I went home and I asked my grandma, and she said, oh yeah, that was my, was my great grandpa. So like, uh, I don't know, if that's something we should be really proud of that he was a murderer, but he was in the 87th and he was acquitted of the murder. Um, and he died on November 26, 18, or 1926, and he's buried in Parkville Cemetery in Dover, York County. Then we have Lieutenant Colonel James Alonzo Stahl. Stahl was born in West Manchester Township, York County. He attended the common schools and York Academy. He learned the printing trade and later became a merchant tailor. He enlisted in Company A, 87th Pennsylvania Infantry and rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He served as the Deputy Collector of Internal Revenue in York from 1869 to 1885, and he died in 1912, and he's buried in Prospect Hill Cemetery. James H. Moody enlisted in Shrewsbury in Northern York County on August 31st, 1861 in Company D. 
On June 12, Moody was taken captive in a skirmish near Winchester and later transported with a long column of prisoners to Libby Prison in Richmond. From a private one enlisting, Mr. Moody, by showing himself a real soldier, got to be a corporal and was promoted to a line sergeant at the time of his discharge. Glenrock Glen veteran served in the 87th Pennsylvania, captured at 2nd Winchester. And that's an excerpt from his obituary. And he died in 1930 and he's buried in Glenrock. And then our most famous member is Daniel P. Regal. And he was born in Adams County in 1841 and he joined the army in 1861. And he received the Medal of Honor for Gallant gallantry during the Battle of Cedar Creek and he was promoted to sergeant in 1864. The President of the United States of America in the name of Congress takes the pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor to Corporal Daniel P. Regal, United States Army, for extraordinary heroism on the 19th of October 1864 while serving with Company F, 87th Pennsylvania Infantry in action at Cedar Creek, Virginia for gallantry while rushing forward to capture a Confederate flag at the stone fence where the enemy's last stand was made. So he is our premier member and we put his face on all of our pamphlets that we hand out at Living History events because who doesn't want to be known for having a Medal of Honor winner. And then I want to leave you with a poem that was written by John Clutter Hoffman. While reading Home Guards to Heroes, this was mentioned um, during the time that the 87th guarded the railroad Again, there wasn't much to do, and a lot of the men got bored, and they got into fights, and they didn't necessarily look back at the time as, you know, worthwhile or a good time, but uh, John Clutter Hoffman did, and he wrote this song, so it's actually a poem, and it's written in the measure and rhythm of Longfellow's Excelsior, so I'm going to read it for you, and then I will end my presentation, but the 87th, we're called to City Point, we ship. When transports o'er the waves we skip, as though bound on a pleasure trip, the gallant 87. To save the capital we speed, to Baltimore, to Wallace aid, to check fold early in his raid, the gallant 87. On July 9th, the foe was stayed. Ah, what a glorious fight we made, but what a bloody price we played, we paid by bleeding 87. Monocacy that day ran red, with blood by loyal, loyal heroes shed. All honor to the noble dead of glorious debt of glorious 87. For Stahl held the bloody field, and not an inch of ground would yield, till by a triple force compelled the fighting 87. Here Dietrich Welsh and Martin died, Walmer, Spangler, and Hack beside. With their lifeblood, the daisies died, ah, bleeding 87. And Captain Lannis, gallant aide, on staff of glorious first brigade, brigade was found wherever duty laid, as was the 87. As orders to the left he bore, to fall back he was wounded sore, while on plating volleys tore the ranks of the 87. Brave Schultz and Lynchenberger here were by the same bullet wounded clear, while facing foe without a fear, and G of the 87. But Washington was saved that day, as Grant and Sheridan both say, by the Battle of Monocacy, the gallant 87. So, thank you. Sure. Can you open that line? I think they're about this. Yes. Were you there? Well, yeah, well, if you want to stand up, this gentleman, um, we did a memorial ceremony for his, you said your great grandfather? Great 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 grandfather, yeah. Uh, Henry Schaefer. Henry yeah. Schaefer. Yeah. So let's give him a round of applause. Yeah, I just, just found out about that back in the spring with my. My well, sister was doing some ancestry work. Yeah. And she ran across cross that. So I've been doing more research on the 87. Okay. And uh, you know, the last man to be killed in the 87 is buried up there. Okay. At Mount Zion Cemetery? Yeah. Well, you, they did a little memorial over his grave, too. Mm -hmm. Plus, what I have done, what I have researched, the last man from York County to die was in 1940. And that was a man named Schultz, and he's also buried up in Mount Zion. It's so, wonderful. I mean, I've, I've lived in that area all my life. Right. Yeah. And uh, I, I've done some, Dennis Grant did some research for Helen Township. Yes. I'm in the preservation group down there. And so I looked it up. We, 93 people with ties to Helen Township served 
in the war. Mm -hmm. Five of them were the 87. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's yeah. I mean, you're a prime example of why we want to do things like this and present about the 87th and keep the reenacting alive because it is such a rich history in this area. Yeah. Uh, my great grandfather, Henry Hill, and your company, he told the story of the a lot of 87th in the room tonight. I love it. Yes. My great grandfather was company H. Rolling there you go. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Anything else? Uh, there, there weren't a lot of people that died in battle, but was there a certain battle with, that was had more, the most 87th that died in it? Um, I believe Winchester, right, Jim? Yeah, Winchester is pretty much known as ripping the 87th apart, unfortunately, and a lot of guys just walked home from that. The 87th was sort of disbanded after that for a while. I'm not telling you why a great great grandfather was wounded at Eden Creek. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah, I mean. Oh, no, that's cool. Thank God he survived. Yeah, I mean, it, it's amazing the people that we've gotten to meet um, through reenacting with the 87th and that have ancestors or, you know, are just interested in their family history and you know I hope that things like this can spur more research on and more pride in little York County and all of the amazing things that have happened from it yeah uh, we have an internet question here I'm not sure if you know this offhand like because there are hundreds of Pennsylvania residents okay do you know of anything done for the 166 uh reenacting one yeah, no no I mean oh. the regiment 166 Pennsylvania does um, that about? I'm not familiar with it, but we we can look into it. So yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know. No, no, no. I mean, we have dozens of unit histories. Right. There. Yeah. Yeah. There was a 199th and a 200th regiment. That was your family. Yes. Yeah. 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 I recently moved to Pennsylvania, so I don't have any relatives in the 87th. But I have a question. I have a question. The um, the Senate states. In 1861, he signed up for three year enlistment. Yes. What happened in 1864? When so when your when your enlistment was over, you either re-upped or you went home. And a lot of the guys did re-up just because you know the war was still raging on, you were getting paid, and hopefully you were, you know, surviving without wounds or uh being taken prisoner. But some men did leave and went home and then some just re-enlisted. Was a three year commitment common? Because it seemed like some were one year. It was 90 days. Yeah, I guess it I guess it would depend who you were enlisting with, but with the 87th, that was a three year enlistment in 1861. It's always struck. Yeah. <laughs> it's always struck me that um, you know, of course the Winchester wasn't a great moment, but the fact that from they 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 seven have sustained the entire war mm -hmm. I mean, from before almost from the day one of the war right to the people of and and I I've always wondered how many of you did that. Um, you know, yeah, you're right. It, it it does seem sort of unique to the 87th, and maybe there's a little bit of York County chutzpah in there that kept them going from the start of the war to the end of the war. But that would be interesting to research how many units hung in there the whole time when, when you're out there uh reenacting when you say you're from the 87th mm -hmm. do people say oh monocracy or do they know uh about the 87th uh no i mean we're just struggling to get people to realize that we're the union and not the confederate or the red coat sometimes <laughs> 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 um, uh, yeah we get some really fun questions out there on the battlefield um it depends i mean i think the casual a uh, tourist and observer doesn't get down on the regimental level to understand where the 87th was from. But if we meet someone that's local and they say, oh, you know, um, I'm here in Gettysburg, but I'm from York County or something, we'll say, oh, well, you know, the 87th was locally recruited out of York County. Did you know that? Or, you know, we try and make a point to say that a lot of us have ancestors that were in the 87th, sort of to spark conversation to see if they know a little bit more. But I don't think anyone's ever, you know, really come up to me and said, like, oh, you're the 87th from York County. And, you know, like, I already know about the 87th um, prior to seeing us. But 
Yeah, I, I like half the battle is just getting people the basic United States Civil War history, but we're getting there. <laughs> yes. Were they trained uh, like the Camp Kirkland or this stuff? Uh, yeah. They were first. Uh, oh, Jim <laughs> jumped on that. Yeah, they were. <laughs> Yeah, there was a few different training plants for the 87. Yeah. At one point now, they were switched from the third floor to the sixth floor. And then I believe they called a much more battle time for the sixth floor. 1864 and 1865 was the sixth. Yes. Oh, my ancestors, John. Sachs or John Sox, no, he didn't know the Sox when he came. Uh, he fought at uh, Antietam at the bloody uh, angle, and, oh. and, uh, bloody road, I think, it was, uh, bloody lane. And then um, and he was captured then at, at the Second Battle of Winchester. Mm -hmm. But he was in the Maryland the Fifth. Okay. So I, I, need, I guess I need to do more research. So. Uh, so why why they were all together? Oh, okay. You mean why they were all? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't think he changed because he was. Uh, he had a farm in Gettysburg. Uh, okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Anything thank else? Thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, this presentation. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, because you're a winner tonight. <laughs> That's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you guys so much for coming and listening to me i know i'm no uh scott mingus but i hope i made it worth your time <laughs> thank you so much you have a website i i do um the 87th pennsylvania.org is our reenacting website and then um, my website is preserving the history of you uh newburytown dot work so i have my cards over there on the oh, table yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> but yeah and i'm on all the social media so i don't know if any of you are on facebook or instagram but i'm on that too so always doing something with history thank you, thank you. <laughs>